Our lecturer this evening is Jack Gradeska, and it's funny because most people, they send me their bios and they're really long, but Jack just wants to be introduced as author, historian, archaeologist, and former TV host. So those are big accomplishments in a nice, short, and sweet little package there. So um, without further ado, we welcome Jack Gradeska. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. Liquor. Booze. Hooch, who hit John, water, foot water, brew, whatever you want to call it. Adult beverages have been an integral part of American society since the 13 colonies were first occupied by Europeans. What most people don't know is that liquor was one of the causes of the American Revolution. Okay, we're at the hangover picture. Okay, so I'll give you a couple of, of examples. On his midnight ride, Paul Revere stopped in a Medford, Massachusetts tavern for a drink of rum. George Washington um, made beer. In a letter to his friend, his instructions for making a small batch of, of beer began with, first, find a bucket of about 30 gallons and a shovel. Rum may also have been the real motivation of the Boston Tea Party. See, King George had imposed taxes um, on um, sugar and molasses, limiting alcohol production, which could have been a bigger reason for the protests. The Sugar Act and the Molasses Act actually generate a very, very little income for the crown. It seems that uh, colonial merchants found unique methods of importing goods and booze. They turned to smuggling. In fact, the Boston Tea Party Museum writes, accused of smuggling, John Hancock's sloop Liberty was seized by the British on May 9th in 1768, causing a riot to ensue. The British had accused Hancock of offloading goods without paying custom dues, and John Adams defended him and got the charges dropped without any explanation whatsoever. The incident only reinforced Hancock's opposition to the Townsend Tea and Stamp Acts, which led to the Boston Tea Party and the American Revolution. So maybe that was the first imposition of, of some sort of prohibition. In 1794, the US government, apparently not learning anything from the British, attempted to enforce a, a, some sort of um, an excise tax on whiskey. A group of armed distillers from Western Pennsylvania took up arms against the government in protest. 13,000 federal troops easily squashed the rebellion, but the whiskey and beer industries in the United States would be two of the top growth industries of the 19th century. For example, between 1850 and 1873, the number of breweries in America shot up from 431 to 4,131 distilleries. Now, alcohol has always been a major component of our society. We assume, most of us assume, that in the early 20th century, our great grandparents and our grandparents were prudish and uptight by comparison to today's society. 
it wasn't actually quite opposite. There was no code for silent films to follow, and the results were what even cable TV couldn't show today. There were parties, and women's fashions were considered scandalous. And those newfangled velocipedes, cars, were the devil's contraption. Cars became reasonably affordable in 1919, but there were no precedents and no instructions on how to drive them. You went, you bought your car, they gave you keys, and off you went. So motorists exhibited very little driving skills. Um, and then there were the youths of the area. Cars replaced the soda fountain as a place to bring a date. So outraged were small segments of the Bayshore community that ordinances were placed were passed in short towns prohibiting driving with your arm around a girl. As you can guess, everything from crime to lascivious behavior was blamed, blamed on demon rum. The, the movement to prohibit alcohol uh, had been underway for about a century led by organizations like the Women's Christian Temperance Movement, the Anti-Saloon League, and here in New Jersey, the Methodist Church groups in Ocean Grove and Asbury Park. These groups formed a powerful issue, single-issue coalition that relentlessly lobbied local, state, and federal governments. When the states began enacting laws to prohibit the manufacture and sale of intoxicated beverages, Temperance Society stepped up the pressure on Congress. They wanted to go national. The Anti-Saloon League's Wayne Wheeler, who was an attorney by trade, conceived and drafted the bill, which was named after Andrew Volstead. Volstead was the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, and he managed the legislation. In 1917, Congress sent the 18th Amendment, known as the Prohibition Amendment, or the Volstead Act, to the states with a seven-year deadline for passage. The First Amendment, to have a time restriction, within 13 months, the states had ratified it. The 18th Amendment banned, but did not define intoxicating liquors. You know, some of the members of Congress who voted for the amendment just assumed that it referred to hard liquor and that beer and wine would be exempt. But Wheeler had drafted a really tough enforcement act. The Volstead Act defined an intoxicating beverage as anything that contained more than one half of 1% of alcohol. The Volstead Act made it illegal to manufacture, sell, barter, trade, import, export, deliver, furnish, possess such beverages. In New Jersey, some of the area residents supported the act and the benefits that supposedly would go with it. And these were such as lower crime rates, fewer automobile accidents, and an end to risque behavior. The rest of the state, and especially here at the shore, had a different opinion and tended to ignore it. Local state and local and state police refused to enforce the Volstead Act, and they either ignored it in favor of chasing speeders and inept drivers, or helped the liquor smugglers for a cut of the action. Okay, now we know the abridged version of how prohibition came about. We could talk about the politics behind the Volstead Act all night long, and still not really touch on all the factors that were really involved. But that's not why we're here. We want to talk about booze and bootleggers. The towns along Sandy Hook Bay, Atlantic Highlands, Leonardo, and Highlands, were always resort towns up until recent times. But Atlantic Highlands was hands down the biggest draw. Um, there was the Atlantic Beach Amusement Park that opened in 1915 and stretched for some 17 acres along the waterfront on the east side of Bay Avenue from Avenue A all the way to Avenue D and drew thousands of people from Manhattan and the five boroughs each and every day during the summer. An excursion ship 
the Mandalay, left Battery Park every morning to ferry people for the two-hour sail to the park. There were bungalows and hotel accommodations and a plethora of restaurants to cater to tourists. But Atlantic Highlands in the 1920s had another distinction. Contemporaries claimed that Atlantic Highlands was one of the most important East Coast ports of entry for illegal alcohol. There were so many small gangs of bootleggers at the beginning of Prohibition, it wasn't funny. Most started by making their own whiskey for themselves or um, some other type of alcohol for their own consumption or selling some of it to their neighbors. But that all changed. Tonight, we're going to, we're going to focus on three bootlegging gangs, all of whom have ties to Sandy Hook Bay Area. Um, one is the Waxy Gordon Gang, the Alexander Lillian Gang, and the Luciano Gang. These three were major players at the smuggling in the smuggling of liquor, and they all had one thing in common, Arnold Rothstein. It was 1920. Irving Wexler, also known as Waxy Gordon, an opium purveyor and a former gifted pickpocket was nervous. He was, will, he was about to see Arnold Rothstein. Rothstein was famous in the underworld. This is a guy that fixed last year's World Series, Gordon told his partner, Max Hassel. So he sure has the dough. He's smart. He's the guy we want. But now he was sweating. Waxy had, he believed, anyway, a great way to get himself and his partners, Hassel and Big Head Maxie Greenberg, rich. The plan was to establish a rum running gang out of Detroit, using Canadians to procure the liquor and local Detroit, Detroit gangsters to import and distribute the booze. Waxy believed it was too great of a plan a foolproof plan. All they needed was 175,000 from Rothstein to get started. Now, sure, he'd take his usual 25%, but it would be worth it. Just then, the door opens, and Waxy went in to meet the mob's big bankroll, Arnold Rothstein. Now, after listening to the plan, Rothstein dismissed Gordon. He wanted to think about the plan before investing, the truth was he knew that their scheme was destined not to make Waxy Gordon and his friends rich, but get them pinched by the cops or dead. The problem was Detroit. See, Rothstein didn't know any of the mobsters in Detroit. And Johnny Terrio and his sidekick Al Capone ran Chicago. So that was out of the question because, well, they would want too big a piece. Still, there was merit to his idea. A few days later, on a bench in Central Park, Rothstein met with Waxy Gordon. He would give them the loan of 175,000 for the usual percentage, but the operation would be run from New York rather than Detroit. They would also use an associate of Rothstein's who was on the lam in England, and instead of going through Canada, Harry Mayer, Mather rather, would buy 20,000 cases of liquor in Britain and ship it to the United States. In the end, the plan worked exactly the way Rothstein had planned. And he didn't stop there. He knew that he could not trust the New York mob. Um, they, wouldn't, they, they wouldn't just expand his idea. They would take his plan, cut him out of it, or worse. So Arnold recruited and trained his own gangsters. He found young hoodlums that he could mold. Aside from Waxy Gordon, the Waxy Gordon mob, um, he bankrolled Lucky Charlie Luciano, Meyer Lansky, Vito Genovese, and Ben Siegel. This was exactly the type of gang he was looking for to expand beyond what the Gordon gang could do. All of this would be for his small percentage. It was here at this point in history that bootlegging saw its beginning. 
and with it came the birth of organized crime as we know it today. Meanwhile, in New Jersey, a young tavern owner was watching the action. When the Volstead Act became law, Joseph Rainfeld continued selling liquor in his Newark tavern as if there was no prohibition. See, he had an agreement, as he called it, with the police. However, the agents of the newly formed Bureau of Prohibition were not so easily bought. He was fined for illegal sale of liquor. He decided that he needed to find a new way of doing business, and it was then that he was introduced to Al Lillian. It was 1921. Picture yourself standing on 6th Avenue and 28th Street in Manhattan, and across the street, you see Al Lillian, a 24-year-old delivery driver for his father's produce store in Elizabeth. Um, and he had been waiting on that corner for three hours with one of his business partners, Sam Candle. They were waiting to, to conduct, to conclude, a business meeting with two New York bootleggers named Katz and Kaplan. Lillian and his three business partners, um, Sam Candell, Morris Urim, and Nelson Ivey, planned to buy bonded whiskey certificates. And that's whiskey that was still available during Prohibition with a doctor's prescription. To supply that whiskey, six whiskey producers were given licenses by the government to bottle and sell uh, medicinal liquor. It was all government stamped and bottled in bond at 100 proof. So from Katz and Kaplan, they planned to buy these for the sum of $10,000. The night before, Morris Urim had met with Katz at a saloon in Newark. In the saloon's back room, Katz had, had wanted to see the money before handing over the certificates. Only makes sense, right? The other man, um, so um, Urim took the money out of his pocket and gave it to Katz to count. The other man made a big production of counting, dividing the money into two piles, and then said, let's put the money in two envelopes and store it in the safe to keep it secure. I kind of know where this is going. We'll meet tomorrow, and I'll give you the certificates. So Urim, Urim agreed, and after locking the two envelopes uh, full of cash in the safe, the two men went their separate ways. So the next day at 2.30 p.m., three and a half hours past the time the meeting with Kaplan and Katz was to occur, Lillian and Candell gave up, and they went back to, to the tavern in Newark. They opened the safe. They pulled out the two envelopes. When they opened them, they found newspapers cut into the size of dollar bills. Now, like any victims of a robbery, Lillian and Candell went to the police and told the tale. The officer just laughed and showed them the thousands of listings for Katz's and Kaplan's in the New York City phone directory and told them to get lost. Al Lillian came to the United States with his family from Hungary in 1908, he was 11. Even at that age, he was considered ambitious, intelligent, and driven to make it big and live the American dream. Later, he dated and eventually married Elizabeth Cohen, and her brother, a con man and racketeer, Sam Cohen, is the one who actually introduced Al Lillian to Joe Rainfeld. The two men decided to go into business together. Rainfeld had an idea. Rather than buying the booze in England like Rothstein's crew, they would work through Montreal. See, Rainfield had a contact there. The Bronfman family owned several hotels. And to remove the middleman, they became distillers of alcohol to supply their hotels and garner a bigger profit. Rainfeld would buy the liquor from the Bronfmans. Now, at that point, three miles off the coast of Sandy Hook, New Jersey, ships loaded with contraband hooch always were waiting. The police referred to it as rum row. 
Rothstein's bootleggers would use similar vessels to go out to the boats and bring liquor back to shore, then transport to holding facilities prior to distributing it to speakeasies, restaurants, and other customers. Rainfield and Lillian thought that that was a huge risk and a huge overhead in terms of vehicles and manpower. Bootlegging was, of course, a business, and businesses need to maintain or maximize profits. So they would sell, their idea was to sell customers receipts instead of the actual product. Then it would be up to the customer to take the receipt out to the waiting ships and pick up their liquor and bring it to shore. They wanted the booze, they assumed the risk. Rainfield and Lillian, the Rainfield and Lillian gang were basically the brokers. As the profits rolled in, Lillian invested in the business. He purchased a mansion on the hill overlooking Atlantic Highlands that once belonged to Oscar Hammerstein. He had local contractors make significant changes so that to the casual eye, everything seemed copacetic and above board. Nothing was at as it really seemed though. And that's not me barking, that's Iggy the puppy. Alexander Lillian, now based in Atlantic Highlands, guaranteed that the shipments picked up at Rum Row would make it to shore at Wagner's Beach or other secluded beaches on Sandy Hook Bay and all the way to Virginia. <coughs> Excuse me. He set up a high-powered radio at 33 Shrewsbury Avenue in Highlands, um, which is the next town over. And associate Malcolm McMaster's operated the radio, guiding the syndicate's freighters from St. Lawrence River to Sandy Hook. Lillian made sure that all of Rainfield's shipments came ashore. He set up a network of police, local officials, and the Coast Guard commander at Sandy Hook. All of them were on his payroll. Soon, other rum-running syndicates sought him out to protect their shipments as well. Using Rothstein's business model, Lillian took $2 per case um, as payment. He made a ton of dough. Ships on Rum Row transported thousands of cases in their hold. The syndicate claimed 8,700 customers and paid out thousands in bribes each week. With his profits, Al Lillian began establishing breweries from New York to New Jersey and Eastern Pennsylvania. The Gordon mob followed his lead and began doing, doing exactly the same thing. By the time of his death, Lillian had expanded his network from the St. Lawrence all the way to Virginia. Now in 1921, Lucky Charlie Luciano and Vito Genovese began working for this guy, Giuseppe the, Joe the Boss Messeria in New York City's Little Italy neighborhood. Eventually, the two became Messeria's most trusted lieutenants. By the mid 1920s, Luciano was a multimillionaire and New York's top bootlegger, making and importing alcohol with other pro prohibition rich associates including Genovese, Frank Costello, Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, um, Louis Lepke Bulkhalter, and Egg Longy Zillman. Zwillman, rather. Waxy Gordon would launch a successful rum-running empire and become a wealthy man. After Rothstein ended his partnership with the two in 1921, he continued to help finance them. Gordon took over two uh, took over two large warehouses when when they split one in the city and the other on long island from his headquarters at the knickerbocker hotel in manhattan on 42nd street gordon operated an efficient operation which he modeled after his mentor rothstein gordon lived in a lavishly decorated 10-room apartment in manhattan's upper west side and owned a large house on the jersey shore by 1929, 
Al Lillian's bootlegging protection empire stretched from the St. Lawrence all the way to Virginia. His organization made $2 per case, as I had mentioned before, of anything imported to the United States from Rum Row. And Oscar Hammerstein would never have dreamed of the modifications that Lillian made to the property. Cars and trucks rolled into the garage at all hours of the night. The cars would pull into the far left corner of the structure where the elevator, the platform of, of which was not distinguishable from the floor of the building, would lower the vehicle to a vault below. There, white-coated technicians would empty the, the car's illicit cargo into a big glass drums. The, and those drums, by the way, hold 50 gallons of whiskey. When the lot would be filtered, there the lot would be filtered, bottled, corked, and placed in cardboard boxes. On top of the house was an antenna for the most powerful radio on the East Coast. On a prominent gable on the third floor was a bright blue light. It could easily be seen from 12 miles out to sea. When the coast was clear, the fast boats came in to offload their cargo at Wagner's Beach in Atlantic Highlands next to the oil storage facility. Lillian's direction had changed as well. Not, on, not only was he ensuring safe passage for several bootlegging crews, like Waxy Gordon's boys, but he had begun building breweries throughout New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Beer was hard to source for the syndicate, so he would become a provider. Besides, he philosophized, prohibition wouldn't last forever, and breweries could be legitimized as soon as the Volstead Act was, was repealed. The operation had grown unwieldy in size. There were multiple wireless radios set up, up and down, an operation on Broadway in New York City, speedboats, freighters, and guns, lots and lots of guns. Money changes everything, but nothing lasts forever. It was 4.30 p.m. on October 16th, 1929. Agents of the government coordinated 35 simultaneous raids against Alexander Lillian Syndicate from Atlantic City, New Jersey to Sag Harbor, New York. The feds had been tipped off by the syndicate's own radio transmissions. It took them six months to put this operation together. 130 agents participated along with state police units um, and it, the local police though, and county police were kept in the dark. They were suspected of, of being on the syndicate's payroll. So the feds didn't want to, war, want to allow the bootleggers to be tipped off by them. At the main radio center, the wireless operator of translating to a large syndicate vessel loaded with liquor when he quickly got arrested. A federal agent who had studied and learned Al Lillian's radio codes jumped on the key and transmitted instructions to the vessel, leading it to an encounter with the Coast Guard. At the Hammerstein Mansion overlooking Atlantic Highlands, a large contingent of, of agents um, climbed the hill and attacked Lillian's veritable fortress. Agents would later report that they discovered gun emplacements, a large armory of military weapons, powerful telescopes mounted in a cupola observation tower, and underground storage vaults and tunnels. That night, according to the New York Times, 200 miles of syndicate's operation fell into federal hands, including landing areas, warehouses, offices, and sale rooms. The Fed said that the radio center was housed in a bungalow on, a, on the property, away from the main house, and that a large cave was dug in the side of the hill for liquor storage, but did not specify the quantity that was seized. 34 men, including Al Lillian and his brother William, were indicted by the grand jury after the raid. When these men got their day in court, most were acquitted. 
including the Lillian brothers. While the story of the raid, like the Lillian murder, was carried across the country, one aspect of the story left out of the newspapers was that a lone gangster on the steps of the mansion, and as the federal agents approached and identified themselves, he attempted to defend himself, the booze, the house, etc., and opened fire on the law. His demise was an ugly one, and history has forgotten his identity. The story did not end after the raid and subsequent acquittals. The Lillians had other radio setups that the feds knew nothing about. They, want, they waited a while, and then they simply went back to work. But times were changing. There was more violence, more double crosses. You needed a scorecard to figure out who was in league with whom. On Saturday, August 15th, 1935, 1931, Lucky Charlie invited Joe the Boss to lunch at a restaurant called Nueva Villa Tamaro on Coney Island. They and another associate were seated in, in a back room where they began to play cards as they were waiting for lunch to be served. Well, Luciano excuses, excused himself and strolled back to the restroom in no hurry whatsoever. Masseria and the other man remained at the table. Meanwhile, a blue sedan pulled up in front of the restaurant and four men entered the main dining room, walking briskly toward the back room. Masseria looked up toward the men's room, thinking that he had just heard Charlie come out. Just then, the door behind him burst open and Vito Genovese, Albert Anastasia, Joe Adonis, and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel rushed into the room, guns blazing. All in all, 20 rounds had been fired when it was all over and, and said and done. When the gunfire stopped, Joe the boss was dead with three bullets in his head and one straight through the heart, clutching an ace of spades in his right hand. Now, with Masseria gone, rival Salvatore Man Maranzano, pardon me, recognized that Italian, uh, reorganized the Italian American gangs in New York City into five families, headed by Luciano, Joe Profacci, Tommy Gagliano, Vincent Mangano, and himself. Maranzano called a meeting of the crime bosses in Wappingers Falls, New York, and declared himself boss of all bosses. Now, Luciano and his second in command, Vito Genovese, seemed to go along. But in reality, they were merely waiting. Before long, Maranzano began to see Luciano as a threat. And he hired Vincent Mad Dog, Mad Dog Call, who was an Irish gangster, to kill him. However, Tommy Lucchese alerted Luciano that he was marked for death. So on Thursday, September 10th, 1931, Maranzano ordered Lucky Charlie and Vito Genovese to his office in what is now the Hems Helmsley Building in Manhattan. Thinking that it was a setup, the pair sent four Jewish gangsters whose faces were unknown to the Maranzano's people. They had been um, secured with the aid of Meyer Lansky and, and Benny Siegel. Disguised as government agents, Two of the gangsters dis disarmed Maranzano's bodyguards. The other two, aided by Lucchese, who went there to point Maranzano out, stabbed the boss multiple times before, before shooting him. Charlie Luciano took charge of the family, the five families, with his trusted second in command, Vito Genovese, by his side. He abolished the title of bosses of bosses in favor of forming the commission, as he called it, to serve as the governing body for organized crime. In 1932, the bootleggers, realizing that the Volstead Act was on its last legs, were going legitimate. The Lillian brothers and Waxy Gordon's crew had filed for permits to have to brew beer and distill alcohol as soon as prohibition was repealed. 
they figured that would pre prevent them from losing income. At a meeting in Atlantic City, Lucky Charlie and the commission informed all the bootleggers that as prohibition would likely be repealed in the very near future, the commission would expect a percentage of their profits or their newly legit breweries and distilleries would face bombings, hijackings, and arson. The majority of the soon-to-be former bootleggers acquiesced. However, Waxy Gordon and his crew, and presumably the Lillian crew, told Lucky Charlie and the commission to 23 skidoo, get lost. On March 23rd, 1933, Alexander Lillian was murdered in his home in Atlantic Highlands. A king of spades was left near his body. Just like Mazaria, who had that ace of spades next to his murdered cor corpse. A few weeks later, a few weeks after Lillian's murder, Waxy Gordon, Max Hassel, and Max Greenberg were in a room that they rented at, in Elizabeth, New Jersey at the Essex Hotel. That room was the office where they presided over their bootlegging empire. With them were several other men. Turns out it was a hit. The only member of the gang to survive was Waxy Gordon himself. And all roads pointed back, pointed to Lucky Luciano. It was doubtful that Luciano Lansky, Genovese, or Siegel executed Lillian. To do so would make Al Lillian seem way too important. Luciana needed a low-level muscle, <clears throat> a local-level muscle, but one that would be trusted by Lillian and allowed to enter into his fortress that was the mansion. As all the players are deceased and time obscures most of the evidence, all that's left is circumstantial evidence gathered from contemporary publications. For example, these two guys. In 1931, Jonas Tuman of Asbury Park became Monmouth, the Monmouth County prosecutor. One of his first acts was to install his friend, Harry B. Crook, what a great name, as chief of Monmouth County detectives. During their tenure in office, the two men built a criminal empire of their own, extorting money from speakeasy owners for protection, endorsing gun permits for gangsters, and Crook provided muscle for gangsters as well, once threatening to quote unquote rub out Richard DeWitt, who was the publisher of the Long Branch Daily Record. He was trusted by the mob. In 1934, both Tuman and Crook were on the hook for their misdeeds while in office. Harry Crook, chief of Monmouth County detectives, was looking at 52 charges against him. A former investigator, um, Thomas Andley, testified that he watched Crook's brother, Fred, destroy seized slot machines in the cellar of Crook's home in Asbury Park. Another witness testified Crook failed to investigate three murders in Monmouth County, one was Frank Chichi Santelli, James Buff Morrison, and Frank McGill. McGill's charged, bo charred body was discovered in a burning automobile. According to Eatontown Police Chief Kirkgaard, Harry Crook, after seeing the body of McGill aflame, said that the case looked like a suicide. Additional testimony spoke to Crook allowing his son to operate a speakeasy in Asbury Park, completely untouched. And in the end, Crook would be ousted from office on only six of the 52 charges. But that was enough to keep him out of public service for the rest of his life. Tuman's charges were myriad. Under e examination by prosecutors, Tuman was asked about cases that he never brought to trial despite grand jury indictments. He claimed that he never heard of the cases. One of these cases that Tuman never heard of was a charge against Alexander Lillian on carrying a 38 caliber, an unlicensed 
38 caliber pistol. That case never made it to court either. Now, what we're going to talk about now is pure speculation based on circumstances and no hard evidence. Al Lillian shoots down Luciano's attempt at a protection racket, as does Waxy Gordon. Luciano hires local muscle to hit Lillian. Lillian had to go first as he was too smart and well-respected in the circle of rum. Waxy Gordon and others typically followed his lead. Luciano hired, um, Al Lillian is at home. His driver and his groundskeeper are on, on an errand that Lillian dreamed up to get them out of the house. The phone rings. It's Harry Crook. And he tells Lillian that he has permits and other things that Lillian would need to move into a legitimate business model ahead of his competition or some such thing like that. Lillian tells Crook that he'll leave the gate open um, and to come right in. So Crook comes to the house and kills Lillian, leaving the king of spades near the body. He leaves quickly, returning to his home in Asbury Park and waits. Later that night, he gets a call from the local police informing him of Lillian's murder and at that moment, the assassin takes over as the investigator into the murder that he himself committed. No one was ever charged in Alexander Lillian's murder. Now, did it really happen that way? We'll never know. All of those folks are, are long deceased. Records are gone. Um, autopsies are gone. All of that sort of thing. But you could build a circumstantial case against Crook and Tuman um, for the murder of Al Lillian. And is there any doubt in my mind that Luciano was behind it? No, he was disrespected in front of the entire commission by Lillian and Gordon. The Volstead Act was repealed by, by the 21st Amendment in 1933. The bootleggers were either in jail or had become legitimate and wealthy businessmen. And they just blended into society. Their nefarious past purposely forgotten. Al Lillian was murdered in his home 90 years ago this past March, and the case is still open. So prohibition is over. Cheers, folks. And that's the end of my presentation. Hi, Jack. Hi. Thank you so much, that was great. And now we have Q&A for, for Jack, who's got questions. Hmm, any questions? So Jack, I was noticing, you know, Italians always get a bad rap for um, being mobsters, myself being Italian. So not that I'm sensitive to it, I'm not at all. But, you know, I also noticed there's a lot of Jewish American mobsters as well. There were, um, there were, to be honest with you, bootlegging um, leveled the playing field. Everybody became a mobster. Um, there are, when you look at court records in Freehold, um, what I get a kick out of having raised um, in the Atlantic Highlands area is that I see the name, the family names of people that I went to school with. And it was their grandfathers and great grandfathers who, um, who, who were part of the, the bootlegging. Um, there is a woman that I went to grammar school with whose father was a contractor, a building contractor, whose, whose father was a contractor. And her grandfather actually built the garage for Al Lillian that had the, ele the, the freight elevator that took the cars and the trucks into a lower vault. Wow. That's very cool. So there was, there were, everybody was involved. I mean, it was, it, it, what's that, that line from the song, the lore of easy money has a very strong appeal. It, it certainly did. Um, so hold on one second. I see people raising their hands, but I'm not going to unmute. So if you could put it in the chat, I'll read your question. 
Um, Anne is asking, do you know how much it costs to get a legal permit to use alcohol during prohibition? You know, I really don't. Um, it, I would assume that they made it somewhat prohibitive mm -hmm. um, because they, the feds wanted to enforce the, the laws. Um, I, I do know that, I'll give you a really good example, and it's not about the cost, but it's about the lengths that they would go through. There was a patent medicine on the market that was called Jamaican ginger, and it had been around since the 1880s. And the feds came in and basically created the, this, this, these hurdles that the manufacturers had to jump through, where um, they would measure the particulates in the Jamaican ginger after boiling it down to nothing to make sure that there was enough ginger in it to make it taste awful and there wasn't enough alcohol to get a buzz and then you could sell it. <laughs> well, what's the use in that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So people actually, the, the downside to this is that to increase products and reduce that ginger taste and to increase the alcohol, they started using um, chemicals that were in lacquer. Like and, turpentine, right? Turpentine yes. was one of those, yeah. That was one of them. And, and it turns out, and, and other chemicals as well, and it turns out that 55,000 people, some right here in Monmouth County, um, wound up what they called Jake leg, which suddenly they were paralyzed and they couldn't walk and they had motor skill problems and things of that nature. So PSA tonight, do not drink turpentine, anyone? <laughs> I'm going to avoid that. Um, so Gary Soretsky. Hi, Gary. Um, he's asking, what, what would you say the best sources are for this topic? You know, truthfully, whenever I write on this top topic or other historical sources that are within the 20th century or the 18th, other 19th century, I generally go to newspapers.com and I look up, I, I look up the stories. When we read history books, we realize that the history books have been written over and over on different subjects. And in my mind, it's almost like playing that kid's game of telephone. Yeah. So I like to actually read the original news reports to kind of get a handle on what had happened at the time. So mm -hmm. I would definitely say newspaper.com. Um, I would get a subscription to the New York Times for their Wayback Machine, as they call it where you can look through all their archives. Um, and there are just amazing stories about our area in the New York Times during Prohibition, because apparently um, we were the major port. Mm -hmm. uh, where'd the ter term bootlegger come from? It's a good one. Wow. You know what? That's something that I actually don't know. If anybody finds out, um, please let me know. My email is on that first slide. Oh, you stumped him. Okay, that's you good. You did. <laughs> um, and I think if you go to the Monmouth County Archives um, website, Gary did um, an exhibition on prohibition that was wonderful. I remember the catalog and, and they have the catalogs available for you to look at some of the objects from uh, Monmouth County and like surrounding areas. So that was a really great one too. Oh, terrific. Um, someone is asking, did I miss the significance of playing cards left at the scenes of the murders? Yeah, so that would be like their calling card, right? Couldn't really technically be tied to them, but you know, there was a certain card that was associated with their their gang, their crew, right? Well, if you think about it, Joe Masseria was um the boss, the boss, the big boss. Mm -hmm. So he got the ace. Al Lillian wasn't that important, so he just got the king. Hmm. And oh, I don't so it was assigned to them. They didn't get to pick their card, huh? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> and I and I don't know if there were cards left at at the um, the massacre in in the Essex Hotel. I, I you know. Okay, so let's see what else. What else? Somebody's asking me if the Lillian Hammerstein Mansion still exists, and that's Paul. Um, you know, there are two schools of thought on this. I happen to be on, in, in one direction and others are in a different direction. Now, there is a mansion 
that when you look at it, it looks exactly like the pictures of the Hammerstein mansion um, that we see in the contemporary newspapers. And it's at zero Serpentine Drive overlooking Atlantic Highlands. However, I'm also told that it was actually across the street from that. And it was on a property at 25 Fairview in Atlantic Highlands overlooking the town. And supposedly um, the property burnt down and it was rebuilt. And yeah, when I, again, when I, it, just by observation, when I'm looking at the Serpentine Drive property, it's exactly as described by, by the federal authorities when they stormed the hill. The garage is still there. Um, the difference is it's been renovated and there's a, an apartment above it. I can't imagine what's underneath it. Um, and it looks exactly the same. So I'm going to say, Paul, that it does exist. But um, we really, there, there's really, the only way to check that out is to, to go to Freehold and take a look at the tax record as to who owned both properties in the 20s. Mm -hmm. And if we can find Oscar Hammerstein, um, then we'll know which house it was. County clerk, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and someone's asking if the background in, in your image is a local establishment. No, actually, that is a real speakeasy that was operating in New York from the time of prohibition <clears throat> up until quite recently, I think just a few years ago, called Chumley's. Um, if you get by the time this is over, I'll have remembered the address, but um, they just shut down recently. Oh, that's a shame. That's very cool, actually. Yeah, I like the background, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... I think that's all the questions. Does anybody have any more questions for Jack? I, I am seeing one here that I just need. Is that a question? But okay. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jack. This was great. Very informative. Thank and, you. Uh, in well, a couple of days, here. I'll have it up on YouTube. So anybody who missed it can, um, can check it out or, or watch it again at their leisure. Okay. Terrific. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank have you, Dana. Bye. Bye now.